Today's episode is brought to you by PodPage, where you can build a beautiful podcast website in five minutes without being a giant nerd. You can check it out for free. Just go to schoolofpodcasting.com slash try PodPage. So a Facebook ad comes up about a book that talks about storytelling. Well, I love to learn about storytelling. The book was called Hook Point. And I clicked the Facebook ad. It took me over to the author's page, had all sorts of great copy and videos and tons of testimonials on how great this book was. I clicked on the buy the book and it takes me over to Amazon. 74% of the reviews are four and five star, but that's not the ones I went to. Uh You guessed it. I went to the one star review. There were only 4% of them. And for me, I have read many, many books. I've taken many courses on storytelling. And they all say the same thing. Stories are good. You should use them. They're good. You should learn how to use stories. Stories are good. So what did this well-written one-star review have to say? I was intrigued by the overwhelming positive reviews, but was disappointed that after reading the first, second, third, and the rest of the chapters, the author has not given a specific step-by-step guide on how to write great hook points. What was given were stories, guidelines, and different articles about hook points. The stories were great, but if you aim to buy this book to learn the skills on how to write hook points, that's me, it will definitely disappoint you. So how much power does that one-star review have? Well, it just got in front of 2,000 people. (laughs) And over the years, people have repeated that if you rate and review me, it helps me get found in Apple Podcasts. And it makes me throw up in my mouth a little bit because it's been proven many times not to be true. And just because they weren't helping us get up the charts, myself and my friend Joe Salcihai, who is from the very successful Stacking Benjamins podcast that is now on Westwood One. How cool is that? We've both just been kind of going, ah, reviews, ah, who needs them? Who cares? They're not really doing anything for the charts. And that's true. But what are those reviews doing to the general public that don't care about the Apple charts? You've got your target audience right in front of you. What did I just do? I jumped right to the one-star review. And so Joe and I have been kind of blowing off reviews. And you know what? Joe took a very expensive class from MIT, and he came back and said, hey, Dave, we're wrong. And today we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about growing your community and managing a community in a Facebook group. And I think I realize why you haven't started your podcast. Hit it, ladies. The School of Podcasting with Dave Jackson. Podcasting since 2005. I am your award-winning Hall of Fame podcast coach, Dave Jackson. Thanking you so much for tuning in. If you're new to the show, this is where I help you plan, launch, grow, and monetize your podcast. My website is schoolofpodcasting.com. Use the coupon code LISTENER when you sign up for a discount on either a monthly or yearly subscription. And if you missed last week's show, that now comes with 15 minutes of free consulting one-on-one that you can use multiple times during the month and it doesn't change the price. It's something I'm trying and the reason for that is it's kind of selfish. I like to help people and I want you to get off the ground. Once your podcast is up and going, you're ready to fly, but sometimes getting it off the ground needs a little bit of nudge and so I've added that one-on-one consulting piece to the school of podcasting. The other thing I want to mention here right up front before we bring Joe on is the question of the month. I do this from time to time, and that's where the last episode of the month will feature you, and I need your replies by June 25th, 2021. This month's question is, what is your top, if you had to pick one, podcasting pet peeve, the thing that makes you go, ugh makes you hit unsubscribe, makes you hit next. What's your top podcasting pet peeve? Go over to schoolofpodcasting.com slash question. And not only tell me what your your top 
pet peeve. For some reason, I'm having a hard time saying that is. But also tell me a little bit about your podcast and where we can find it. There's also a bonus question there that's just between you and me. And again, to see that, go over to schoolofpodcasting.com slash question. And I need it by June 25th, 2021. And said, hey, Dave, that whole review thing. Yeah, we got it wrong. So, Joe, thanks for coming on the show, buddy. And I did say we, by the way, because I had <laughs> I've been telling people for a long time, Dave. I'm like, stop, stop it with the whole review thing. Who cares? Your ego is going to be fine without it. And it turns <laughs> out big guy wasn't swinging a miss there. What am I missing on reviews? Well, it's funny, like a lot of people, you know, I'm on social media like we all should be with our shows, right? Talking to listeners, trying to find new listeners. And over the years, I've gone from just pumping up the show of my, you know, what's coming next to making it this back and forth platform and trying to have good conversations. But I've always felt kind of rudderless. Like I feel like when I create a podcast, I know where I'm going show wise. I know where my calendar's headed. I kind of know sound, but when it comes to social media, I got to admit, I'm just throwing stuff out there. So instead of hiring some half-baked guru or three-course bait guru, I saw in a Facebook feed, MIT had a really expensive course. And I said, you know what? I'm going to learn from the experts. And it has been, by the way, a phenomenal use of a lot of money to get this training. But what they talk about and the professor of the course, his name is uh, Sinan Aral. And he has worked with most of the social media platforms out there to help them become more of what he calls in is the title of his book, the hype machine, right? That's really what social media is, is a hype machine. And when it comes to reviews, he says that we are deeply, deeply influenced by other people. And we like stuff when other people like it, and we dislike what we think that others are going to dislike. In fact, he went through this whole physiologically, how we are compassionate. I look at Dave's face, and if Dave is smiling, and I said something that cracked him up, that makes me feel good. If I say something that upset you, then I feel horrible. So we are social beings, and that's the key, by the way, to reviews. In fact, there was this one test Researchers took these posts on social media, Dave, and they rearranged the like buttons. So some of them had lots of likes. Some of these posts had lots of likes and others had just a few. And they took the post and they rearranged them and they rearranged the likes. So now ones that had a lot only had a few, one that had a few had a lot. The posts going forward that had lots of positive likes that earlier had, had almost none, those posts got tons of likes because people thought that other people liked these posts, when in fact, nobody had really liked the post earlier, but you and I see other people liking this stuff and we jump on board uh, those posts and posts that were super popular before that now had almost no likes. Nobody liked those posts anymore. It was so crazy about how we're social be. So when it comes to reviews, you're absolutely right about the Apple algorithm and podcasts and how it really doesn't matter. But it turns out that that stuff doesn't matter. And to make a short story long, here's why. In real life, let's take Apple's five-star program. In real life, most of our life is a two or a three, maybe a three, sometimes a four. Most of the things we go through. So it's like this bell curve that we have in our life. That's not true with online reviews. When you read online reviews, uh, Sinan said that it is a J curve. And you can all look at your shows, my shows like this, tons and tons of five-star reviews, a lot of four-star reviews, a desert when it comes to three and two-star reviews. Nobody rates stuff two and three stars, and then a bunch of one-star reviews, right? So it's this J curve. And when people look at reviews, it's going to be the <laughs> same for almost all of us. When it comes to your podcast, TripAdvisor in the next restaurant you go to, Yelp reviews, whatever, the first thing everybody does, it turns out, we go look at the negative reviews and we'll look at that one star review. And what we look at is to see if these people are complete whack jobs right? and, and, and we're just not going to pay any attention to them or if they, and this is the kiss of death, by the way, if somebody has a one-star review that's incredibly well-reasoned. Incredibly well-reasoned one-star reviews are the death knell 
for our podcast. But, and this is the saving grace, if we have a bunch of five-star reviews, lots and lots of five-star reviews, people generally won't read the five-star reviews, but if there's lots of five-star reviews compared to this one one one-star review, and if the five-star reviews are more recent than the one-star review, people will go, well, you know what, Joe or Dave in this story, you went and fixed that thing. So you fixed it. So guess what? That, that person believed that, but that's not the case anymore. So we reason in our heads using this five-star system, whether we're going to listen to a podcast or not. And so getting lots of five-star reviews is super important. Now, here's the problem. The problem is most fans don't think about giving five-star reviews. They only give five-star reviews if you ask them to give you re- the review. One-star reviews are more than happy to tell you what a piece of work you are doing. <laughs> and, so, and, so, true. and so you got to counter that. And, you know, l- looking at different things, and this is my interpretation. When I came back to my team, I said, I think we got to be like 10 to one, man. Because now we're at like six to one. I'm about six, five star reviews to one, one star review. I think I got to get that to 10 to one. So we are going to start doing some of this stuff that I used to think was kind of slimy, right? Give me a five star review. Show me that you did. And I'm going to give away a book from a recent guest that we had on the show. We'll do stuff like that. I used to hate that because I thought this doesn't matter. But now what I'm doing is I'm trying to get people that would give me a five. And I want to be clear here. I don't want somebody that was going to give me a three-star review to give me a five-star review so they could win a book. I want those people that already love me to give me a review that they don't think about giving me. In fact, it was funny, Dave, the other day I thought, I've been listening to your show for how long? We've been friends for how long? (laughs) I've never once given you a review. And so last week I went and I reviewed your show and I went through and I reviewed a bunch of my friends' shows because of what I just learned at MIT. So it turns out the algorithm is not what we should be worried about. We need to be worried about that J curve and people going to look for those one stars. The other thing to keep in mind with reviews that I have heard is if you're trying to convince, and Joe, you would know about this, you work a lot with sponsors. It's handy when you can say, I have a really engaged audience and then say, oh, by the way, we have X amount of reviews on Apple Podcasts. That's where that does come in handy. As long as you're not saying, please leave a review, it helps us get found. I'll be fine because that's that's the part. (laughs) It's not, it's not no, true. no, it's not. Yeah. Well, very cool. But yeah, that's unless uh, the, I'm, it's, I, you are right. I'm going to have to go check on my reviews now. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm curious. Any other uh, gems from your class that uh, you would like to share? The second one is following trends, uh, looking at what's trending and finding. And this is great for us. You know, anybody that has a current event show. Uh, look at Google Trends. There's a there's a site called Google Trends. Some people may not know about it. I I didn't know about it until just a few years ago. But but getting on that trend not only will help your social media reach because the algorithm will be nice to you, but also you will do better with people in terms of discoverability. So if you're talking about something that's already trending on Twitter or trending in in any of the platforms that you use, you're much more likely to find to find new listeners. And then using the platforms where where your audience are. I don't I don't use TikTok, even though it's this hot platform. Because, like somebody said the other day, Insta- I have a money show, and Instagram are qualified listen qualified buyers, where TikTokers generally aren't qualified buyers. Not a ton of people that are in my audience that are on TikTok, but <laughs> Instagram's fighting them though, Dave, with Reels, and I as a 50 something year old dude, like Instagram reels where I'm watching people dance all the time. It's just, just not me, but I now am really don't fight social media. Look at where the river's headed and learn that thing because you're much more likely to pick up new people. I'll leave you with one more, which is I think latching onto social media as if it's not a way to drive people to your show but think of it instead as a different stage, as if you're a music festival, right? And you've got your main stage as your podcast. And then your second stage might be Instagram and your third stage might be Twitter. And you're performing on those stages as well. So create content that's specifically for those stages that's synergistic. Man, I'm using all the buzzwords with your, with your, with your podcast instead of this, you know, this promotional drumbeat that you see some people do. Come listen to my show. Listen to my show. Listen to my, don't do that. 
Well, and my thing is always that I, I try to do now is really what social media is. Because if I go to my, you know, Twitter and I say, hey, new episode out this week about how to edit out the boring. Well, my audience knows I have a podcast. If they want to find the, they they know me, like they know exactly where to go. So I'm very much preaching to the choir. But if I said, if you know someone that does interviews, you should share this episode. And, and I'm basically, here is a tool for you to share this with other people who don't know who I am. That's where you can kind of turn your audience into, you know, you're, you're like, oh, if I just had some sort of sales staff to get out there and tell the world about my show. Well, you do. It's called your audience and just give them the tools. And giving them the snippets too, right? Giving them a yeah. snippet of the show. Like if you watch uh, what The Tonight Show does on social media like or, or yeah. SNL, they will play snippets from the entire show on YouTube or on on, on Twitter or wherever you're, you're watching on Instagram. So you'll see little pieces of it so you can sample the show. Instead of telling people to come, give them a little piece of what they're going to get into. The thing I want to try is is what I see Saturday and I live do. And of course, they can't do it because their show is live, but they will do some sort of little snippet to explain who's on the show and who the musical guest is. Because what I hear from people that are trying to do, whether it's through headliner and it's not a crack on the platform, it's just the fact I have I've got a you know 60 minute show and I've got to go find a 30 second clip. Right. That takes forever. And then you have to figure out what color squiggly line. I think for me, it would be easier just to go and come up with some sort of tease on this week's episode. I'm talking with just with Joe from Stacking Benjamins about how reviews are good for you. And, you know, just send that out as a video or whatever, instead of trying to figure out that awesome clip from the, you know, 38 minute mark. And it's like, that's too way time consuming. So it does take uh, forever. Yeah. One of the things I know that a lot of successful shows do is they have some sort of, whether it's a Facebook group or a circle group or a Slack or discord or whatever. Do you have any kind of community with your uh, podcast? We do. We have a, a Facebook group, a closed Facebook group. And for money topics, it needs to be closed so that yeah. uh, people can talk earnestly about their money and not have their relatives peeping in uh, into those conversations. And, and mm. uh, yeah, people want to be able to talk candidly. Like what's the what's the the great part of having a group? And then is there anything you're like going, ah, the groups yep. got out of line again or whatever? So when when we first created it, and I say we because at first it was OG, my co-host and I, OG, of course, is short for the other guy. We had to spend a lot of time, a lot of time keeping the conversation going. And it will feel, Dave, like a nightmare because you're constantly putting things in the group and nobody's talking. And every once in a while you get somebody talking, you feel like you're just beating your head against a wall. But one thing we did is because the show has a lot of comedy, we also wanted to include a lot of comedy in the group. So different than a lot of other financial uh, uh, closed groups that our, uh, uh, my friends have that are in, in our space, our group has a lot of dad jokes and a lot of off topic <laughs> chatter. Uh, which is okay. You can have, and, and, and we set that, you know, you pin something at the top and we pin mom's rules. You can't talk about politics. Number one, politics are fine. There's lots of spaces online to get mad at each other for politics. We're trying to help each other go the same way with your money. So when it gets into economics, which gets into politics, we, we're going to turn it off. And then number two yeah. is we, we, we can disagree and not be jerks to each other. So that's fine. And the third is off topic conversations about stuff that's not money is fine. And it's funny because we'll get sometimes somebody who's new to the group now and and we're having a conversation about you know somebody ran a marathon and we're we're all telling them congratulations and somebody who's brand new will go what does it have to do with money like five of our listeners will go welcome to stacking benjamins like welcome i don't have to do anything <laughs> I'll tell you what we do now, though, because because the brand has grown and we have a social media manager named Gertrude. Gertrude and I spend most of our time no longer just straight posting, but making sure that the flow of post in the river is welcoming and open to everybody. So sometimes, as an example, the dad jokes will get, just get too much. It's just me, 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 me. And while it's funny, I found people from our group when that went too far will go post their serious questions in other places because for a while they thought we were joking around too much. So when we've got four memes in a row, I will post something very serious about money or Gertrude will. And then also we skew more 
men to women. And it, and I don't want it to just be the bro area. I mean, there are places that are like that, but we're a wide audience show. So whenever we get too many things from guys and kind of about guy topics, Gertrude will come in and post something that's really feminine on purpose. So we're more focused now on how the river flows than trying to keep it alive. But at first, you got to do so much work to just get the get, get things moving. We also started doing something else, Dave, just recently. I have uh, uh, some coaching that I get. And during a recent coaching session, they said, what can you do for your listeners that's a little over and above the what maybe – other podcasts do. And it can't, it's got to be something that we can do fairly easily, but also something that's going to show our listeners that we love them and we value them. And what was that one thing? Well, you'll hear about that in just a second. First, I want to tell you about PodPage. If you're like, oh, podcasting, now I got to build a website. Listen to this feedback that founder Brennan Mulligan got. It said, first, a little background. I have literally tried for years to set up a website for my podcast and have met with failure after failure. I'd frankly put the idea of my own website on the back burner to concentrate on other things. To find a host who could instantly find my Apple feed and immediately build my own website was incredible. That's all I needed to know that PodPage is just what I've been looking for. And it keeps adding more things. Now you can actually have a page that showcases all of your guests. When people click on the guest, it shows the episodes they appeared on. And now Brendan is making a similar page to showcase sponsors. Quit trying to shoehorn a podcast into some sort of bizarre Squarespace template that's made for a restaurant. PodPage is made for podcasters with podcaster input. He's got a thousand people in a Facebook group that are saying, hey, it would be cool if it did this. And then you know what he does? He makes it do that. In the description out at schoolofpodcasting.com slash 779, I've got a free course that you can take to learn PodPage. But right now you need to try PodPage and you can do that absolutely free by going to schoolofpodcasting.com slash try PodPage. You put in your RSS feed, it kicks out a beautiful website that you can tweak to match your brand. It's amazing. I have multiple sites on it. Schoolofpodcasting.com slash try PodPage. Back to Joe. What can you do for your listeners that's a little over and above what maybe other podcasts do? And that thing that we did now is uh, we publish three times a week and we do a guide to the show, our Monday and Wednesday show. We do a guide. And I listen to every episode before it goes out anyway, because we're working on so many shows. I don't, I don't want to get caught in a conversation where I don't remember what the hell we're talking about. So I want to listen to my show just before in a complete state. Uh, right. just before my listeners do so I can be in on it. Plus I find stuff. We've got an amazing, an amazing guy who is Steve Stewart, who takes care of us and is the engineer of our show. But there's still times when I want to cut something more or I, it just doesn't sound right. So I want to be the person that makes the show go out. And so uh, I listen to them all. Well, while I'm doing that now, I create this guide that for people that read uh, like The Hustle or Morning Brew, uh, some of these great, funny kind of newsletters, I'll put in a bunch of links to related things that we're talking about. And not what we're going to talk about on the show, but stuff related to what we're going to talk about. We're going to say, hey, well, we have NASCAR driver uh, Corey LaJoy on the show this last Monday because uh, he had a new podcast called Stacking Pennies and we're pissed. But and, and by the way, I'm, I'm kidding about us being upset, but he really right. did have a podcast called Stacking Penny. So we called NASCAR and said, can we get him on the show and make fun of him? We had a great time talking to him, but he was talking about stacking pennies comes from a psychologist. And it's this idea of if you do the little things right, the pennies, the Benjamins mm -hmm. take care of themselves, focus on the little foundation, kind of like you talk about on the show. Right. And so uh, I had links in our show guide to other things, you know, foundations about your money. So what you do when you're trying to get the foundation together, like Corey's going to talk about. So, man, we got a great response to that. It's got to be a good email or your fans are going to hate you. But we have had such a great response to it because we make sure it's a quality email people get for our Monday, Wednesday show now. So let me get this straight. You take the time Think about it and deliver quality and people don't complain. I know, shut up, right? When you're not winging it, you know, that's a good thing. 
And if you want to check out Joe's show, it really is super creative, super fun, and unlike any other money show you will listen to. And that's why it's so successful. And I'm going to bring Joe back on another episode because I really wanted to double down a bit on reviews because I realize right now you might be sitting there going, holy crap, I have two one-star reviews. Oh, what am I going to, because in Apple, you can't do anything about it. There's no way to even reply to that person and say, hey, sorry, you had a bad experience. So I wanted to share some data with you. Back in 2019, Jacobs Media did a tech survey. And in that survey, more or less, if you add the top two together, which were the same thing, 78% of podcast discovery was based on word of mouth, social media, discussion boards, family, and friends. In fact, the last two podcasts that were new to me were referred to me by friends. They said, hey, have you listened to Behind the Desk by CNN? And I forget the other one, uh, I think How to Write Funny. And I listened to them and they were really good. And so I didn't even read one single review. Number two, I don't use Apple Podcasts. I use Overcast and there are no reviews in that. So don't, don't sweat too much. In fact, many of us say you're not a real podcaster until you get a one-star review. With that said, here's some fun data to make you wet your pants. Now, realize this data is about how people research and interact with businesses, but it does point out that reviews can have some value. So they say when it comes to businesses, 94% of customers read online reviews, 72% of customers won't buy until they've read an online review about a business, and 10 is the number of reviews a customer reads before feeling able to trust a business. And I just don't think that's the case for a podcast. So what's interesting, Moz, which is a SEO kind of company, all about building your brand, et cetera, et cetera. They said that 22% of potential customers want a single negative review of your product. Yeah, they're, they're going to kind of go away. 59% of potential customers when there's three reviews, negative, obviously, 70% if you have four. And so for me, and it also said one out of 20 people who've had a bad experience will take time to leave a review online. But again, it only takes one. And so I say that to go back to Joe's point of you want to get that ratio of five-star reviews to one-star reviews way, way lopsided because that may then get somebody to go, huh, that's interesting. They've got three one-star reviews, but they have 97 five-star reviews. And especially if it's a well-written thought out, not love the show, great guess. Like when you actually write something that's meaningful, that will help. And so Joe talked about asking for five-star reviews. And somebody will say, well, is that kind of like assumptive to say, hey, give me a five-star review? I get that. But here's the thing. We all know YouTube. We all watch YouTube. We know right where the subscribe button is. It's in the bottom right-hand corner. And yet every popular YouTuber will say, hey, don't forget to click subscribe and smash the bell. Now, why do they do that? Because it works. So if you want more reviews like I do right now, you can go to schoolofpodcasting.com slash love. And that is a link that I created using the My Podcast Reviews service. That's from Daniel J. Lewis, who is a, a good friend of mine and doesn't make crap. I think he has that on his, his you know business card. Daniel J. Lewis, I don't make crap. But it's a great service because the thing about it there might be people in other countries that are leaving you a review and you have no idea because it's hard. I don't think on a Mac you can switch countries anymore. I know on a PC you can. I know in PodPage it will sync your reviews, but I know Daniel right now has an exclusive promo code. If you go to schoolofpodcasting.com slash MPR, that's short for my podcast reviews, it'll give you four months for free for the first year. 
That's pretty interesting. School of podcasting.com slash MPR. So thank you, Daniel, for that. That is a way to get your reviews and an easy way to direct people where to go to leave a review. And as I said at the beginning of the show, I usually don't obsess over these and I'm not obsessing over them now, but I did log into my podcast reviews. I see where I had 385 ratings and 272 reviews on four different platforms from 14 countries. And of course, what are you going to do? I went to the top of the screen and I said, show me my one-star reviews on all platforms. And it says one-star review, bad. That's the title of it. Bad, not good, not enough thought. It's a commercial for a bad service. And what's great about that is the person that wrote that, Jay Widget, has actually come back and said, hey, uh, I don't think that anymore. He actually or she hung around. And so that is one thing you can do to see all of your reviews because that brings in the pod chaser. It brings in CastBox, and it brings in Apple. So I wanted to kind of wrap that up and say, I realize we're, we're kind of switching gears and saying, Hey, I realize this doesn't do anything in regards to my rankings in Apple podcasts. However, it's probably not a bad idea to ask for five star ratings when you want to, because there may be people that look at ratings and reviews. And if you have many more five star than you do one star, that person might click. Now, the other thing I want to throw in here though, because I'm seeing people do this a little more than usual. And if you're a regular listener to the show, you probably know where I'm going to go with this. And that is your episode titles. Think about this. Put yourself into the shoes of your potential listener. They have found you. We'll we'll just play with Apple Podcasts right now. They've found you an Apple Podcast. You have a, a name that makes sense. And then they look at your titles. And if your title says episode 16, that's not going to entice them to click. And this is another thing. If you're worried about reviews, this is one of the things that can overtake a five-star review. This is what's going to get somebody, and this is just my opinion for the record, this is what could potentially make somebody ignore the one-star review and have them saying, "Uh, you know what, that one-star guy, this probably just wasn't for him. Because when they see a title that they go, ooh, I'd like to see that, and then the next one and the next one, ooh, that looks interesting. I'd love to hear that. And this, they're going to quickly ignore the person that wrote the one-star review that said, bad show, bad commercial, blah, 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 when they see how Jack Reicher got 300,000 downloads per episode. They're going to go, wait, I want to hear that. So keep that in mind. I say this not to make you wet your pants because you got a one-star review because it is going to happen. Now, here's the other thing I wanted to throw in here. And also, for the record, why you're not hearing the second half of Joe's interview because there is another half, and that will be coming in the very near future. But I kind of wanted to focus on reviews here. And I think I've done something inadvertently that may have caused you to step back. And that is, I've been saying, thank you for joining me on my mission to rid the world of boring podcasts. And I kind of say that as a joke, but in a way, kind of not. I hear podcasts sometimes, again, that are just missing a lot of the low-hanging fruit. I just mentioned one, your episode title. But what I want to make sure of is I say, how do I know if I'm boring? Well, are you making people laugh, cry, think, groan, educate, or entertain? And if you answer no to all of those, there's a really good chance you're boring. And I think people are worried about being boring. Like, I'm not worried about putting my stuff out there. I'm worried about somebody saying, you're not very good. And this is something I'm really trying to figure out, and it's, it's a problem I've had since I opened up the School of Podcasting in 2005, and that is, how do I convince somebody they are good? Because there are times when I have people join the School of Podcasting, and they tell me their idea, and I'm like, oh, that sounds amazing. And then they tell me their background, and they have the equipment, and they know how, and they just won't release. 
And I think sometimes, and this might be you, if you have grown up in an environment where someone, whoever it is, made you feel like you're not worthy or you're not good enough or you're on the outside looking in. And I've been there. I have been there, done that. I'll give you an example. I remember when it's funny thinking about this now, I'm I'm getting a little weepy. It's kind of weird because I know what this feels like. My dad was a long distance truck driver. And I remember Sunday at church, something happened that he had to leave earlier. So he didn't go with us to church. And after church, there was something going on at a park and they had a three-legged race with your dad, like all the dads and their kids, three-legged race. And I just remember sitting on the sidelines, just feeling like an absolute piece of crap because everybody else was just having a blast. And I was on the outside looking in and for me, if you asked me, did that really negatively affect me? And I would say, nah, I know my, you know, my dad had to leave. He had to be on the road. But I do remember, like, this sucks. Like, it just does. And so there might have been something in your life that made you feel like, well, I'm not one of the cool kids or nobody really is ever going to listen to me. And I'm here to tell you that there's a really, really good chance because of your life experiences and because of the time you spent in an area and the passion and things of that nature that you have that, yeah, people will listen to you and you are good. Now, let's be realistic. Are you going to come out of the gate brilliant? No, probably not. But I can help you with the school of podcasting. Make sure you're not boring. And there's nothing you can do to make episode one as good as episode 10. It just really, unless you want to like practice for years, but you're not helping anybody with your episode on your hard drive. You're not. You're not inspiring anybody. You're not making anybody laugh, cry, think, groan, educate, or entertain. And I'm starting to think because most people don't talk about that stuff. I'm pretty sure that in some cases, the person that's stopping you from podcasting is not the audience. So many people think about the audience And I don't think it's that, although I think that might be part of it, because, again, you don't have an audience when you first start. I think it's that little voice in our head that's saying nobody's going to listen to you. You're going to look bad. You're going to look stupid. Nobody's going to listen. And I'm here to tell you that is easily avoidable. Now, does that mean you're never going to get a one-star review? Nope, because you're always going to have that one person that tuned into your show and wanted a quick five minute show about such and such and your show kind of looked like that, but doggone it. It was 25 minutes long and they were like, this is too long and too boring. And you know what? That person is not your target audience and there's nothing you can do from stopping them of writing a one-star review because they don't know that they're in the wrong place. You can kind of help that with your description maybe, but one-star reviews are going to happen. And all you can do is remind your audience that if they feel so moved to go to schoolofpodcasting.com slash love, in my case, and leave a five-star review for the show to make that J curve much taller (laughs) than it is right now. One last point I need to make for all my friends in Europe, I realize that 70 plus percent of Europe does not use an Apple iPhone which means they don't have access to Apple Podcasts. If it's ever coming to Android, who knows? Because, you know, that would require Apple to, I don't know, communicate. And I realize you're going to go, man, this guy mentions his sponsor all the time, but that's because I, I love it. And I'm saying this because it's true. If you have a pod page, you have the ability for people to leave you a review on your website, no matter it's it's separate from Podchaser and Apple Podcasts and CastBox. It's just a way for people who want to say, hey, I like you, to leave a review on the actual pod page website. So just another feature of pod page. In the future, you'll be hearing the second half of that interview where Joe talks about how he decided to join Westwood One. 
Thanks again to Joe Salsi High from Stacking Benjamins. Check out his show, stackingbenjamins.com. Thanks to Brendan over at Podpage. Check out schoolofpodcasting.com slash try Podpage. Try it, doggone it, for free. Also want to say thank you to Dave Jackson. That's my producer. Also want to say thanks to David Jackson, my editor. Want to say thank you to Davey Jackson. That's the guy that does all the music for the show. Want to thank uh, Dave Jackson for my social media manager. Also want to thank Dave Jackson for my line producer. Thanks, guys. What a great team. And we will see you next week. Thank you so much for joining me on my mission to rid the world of boring podcasts. Podcasts. Until next week, take care. God bless. Class is dismissed. School of Podcasting.com slash question. Tell us what your pot, your pot, tell us what your pot is. Yeah, and my pot is uh, Maui Wowie, man. Slash try pod page you will be amazed 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 ah. i'm so glad you're still here i forgot to mention joe has a book coming out stacked your super serious guide to modern money management link in the show notes pre-order it today <laughs> <laughs>